My name is Frank Yotso. I'm with the Australian National University. Don't worry, I didn't fly in here just for that. I'm at the end of a very long trip. Um, uh, it's been it's been fantastic being at this conference. I think we have a really great community here. Actually, um, I think that's something actually to to cherish and to to continue as well. And uh, I think you each have the the details of of, of everyone else who attended the conference. Um, and I think it's important actually uh, for these for these con connections to continue um, even when when there isn't a conference. So we've got um, five talks uh, and in fact six speakers um, on uh, on a variety of topics that are all uh, connected through the, the theme of finance. Okay, uh, And so like in the other sessions, we'll get straight into it. Uh, we will all have all of the all of the talks right up front um, and uh, through through very strict timekeeping. Right. We will uh, make sure that there's plenty of time uh, for conversation in, in the room at the end, because really, right, end of the day, uh, we all work in this field um, and, and the conversation about the issues is, is really what, what brings us uh, together here. You've got the program in front of you, or you might. Um, we're making one small change in the order, and the revised order is uh, we'll have um, uh, Ellen Quigley and Emily Bat Batkin first, followed by Bronwyn Tucker, that's the change, then Igor Shishlov, then Amanda Schockling, and then uh, Trusa Dordi uh, to, uh, to uh, close it out. Yeah? Okay, uh, and with that, um, it's over to you, uh, Emily and Ellen. Um, this is a, um, a, a, a dual track presentation. Um, my colleague Emily will be doing the rest. And basically, I'm teeing her up um, for filling in a couple more of the gaps. Um, but I'll be um, starting with basically a review of the literature that contributes to um, an assessment of where there might be um, a, a gap filled in the financing of um, the phase out of fossil fuels. Um, so I, I'm going to kind of rush through this and we can get into it later if you'd like to discuss, that'd be great. Um, but essentially, if you look at the um, actual evidence base behind, let's say, ESG or responsible investment, um, a lot of it doesn't actually look to be connected meaningfully to um, underlying company level behavior change, reduction in fossil fuels, reduction in emissions. It's fairly useless, I'm sorry to say. Um, and so if you, so this is going to be depressing, um, but we'll just rush through where there is some hope in this whole dismal picture of responsible investment or so-called responsible investment. Um, so if you look at additionality by asset class, um, and sorry to get all nerdy right away, but um, you're looking at the effect that an additional investment um, in that asset class would have on, let's say, the company's cost of capital or some other meaningful change. Like it actually matters to the company whether or not you're investing. So if you look at the evidence base for public equity investments, so that's when you buy a share. Um, let's say that Truzar and I are um, buying and selling shares with each other. The company doesn't really care. I mean, we're not famous, I guess. That's part of the problem. But um, uh, they, they don't care whether we own their shares. Um, we are passing the money and the shares back between us. The money is not going to the company, so they don't care. Um, there are some models that suggest that in some magical universe where there enough people did this, it would dramatically affect share price. We do see minor changes in share price. They tend to be pretty temporary and they tend to be associated with the announcement of the sale of the shares, not the actual sale of the shares, which points to another thing we'll return to in a bit, which has to do with social discourse effects. Um, anyway, the, 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 real, the really important asset class in terms of fossil fuels is um, debt. So bank loans and bonds, um, it's the big deal. The rest is kind of neither here nor there. I think IPOs could be important as well because that's when a company is listing on the stock market for the first time. That's also what we refer to as primary market capital or new money. Um, but it's really a debt story. Um, if you look at what's available in the debt market for investors, there is almost nothing there. The major index providers, so an index fund, by the way, for any non-finance types, um, index funds are how a lot of people are passively investing, um, both in public equity and on the bond side. Basically, you just get like a little slice of everything in the entire market and you don't have to stock pick or bond pick, um, as the case may be. You will find all sorts of 
um, ETFs, exchange traded funds, um, tracker funds, whatever on the public equity side, some of which do exclude fossil fuels, for example. Um, but on the bond side, that just is incredibly rare. Um, there now appear to be maybe two exceptions to this rule and they're extremely recent. Um, so uh, basically, passively, a bunch of new money is flowing into fossil fuels on the debt side. Um, so that's insane. And there's almost nothing that an investor can do that's low cost in the same way as they can um, participate in, in other low cost um, index fund products. There's almost no way that they can um, invest in a way that does not automatically pump new money into fossil fuels. Um, okay, and then I'm gonna very briefly run through the kind of shareholder engagement um, research. Oh God, um, there are some, bright spots in that literature, but basically it's kind of depressing. A lot of shareholder resolutions may have like a long-term arc um, of success in, in shifting social norms, but really tend to be requesting disclosure only, don't tend to result in company level behavior change. Private engagements, hard to say, data are poor, but I, any examples given in the literature don't tend to point back to actual company level behavior change. Guess what? Voting against the re-election of directors does um, tend to have more of an effect. Um, and then in terms of uh, 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 debt-based products, um, the threat of exclusion from an index appears to be quite a, a, a push um, for companies. Um, and then just in general, um, the uh, threat of divestment. Um, so basically the social shaming element is quite important as well. Um, so anyway, if you take all of this together, you find out why our team is trying to build a fossil free bond index um, that'll be open source and nonprofit and so on and so forth, um, because it emerges from all of the gaps in the literature and kind of tries to, tries to use that evidence base to build something that can help fill this gap. I'm going to hand over to Emily now to talk about methodologies and those gaps. All right. Um, my name is Emily. Um, as mentioned, I, I'm here affiliated with the Cambridge Center for the Study of Existential Risk. So we kind of came up with this idea to do um, a fossil free bond index, but then we needed to think about sort of developing a methodology for which companies would get included or excluded from this bond index. So um, so we started by looking into the methodologies that are already out there. Um, at the moment, there's sort of a high level race to zero framework for non-state actors as part of that. There's the GFANS initiatives, which is looking at focusing on the finance sector. And within that, they each reference a number of sort of external and pre-existing sort of third party methodologies, including the many you would have heard of TCFD, SPTI, TPI, CA100. I'm not gonna go too much into that, but um, we kind of delved into each of those I'm going to skip that one as well, um, to look at sort of the methodologies and the different metrics they were using to see whether these companies were climate aligned. Um, and, you know, assuming that we could hopefully embed some of these um, data points and, and methodologies into our work. Um, but, but on reflection, um, we found a number of limitations to some of these and they were thematic. So, um, they were heavily focused on disclosure based metrics and Ellen's done some really good work on this, but there's not a great evidence that um, disclosure drives real world environmental performance improvements in companies. Um, also uh, relevant to this conference is very few metrics on phasing out fossil fuels, um, especially, I mean, some reference to the fact that it needs to be phased out, but more focused on the developing a policy side, or again, disclosure based metrics, um, limited engagement with justice and equity. I think that's come up a lot over the last couple of days. Um, and also exclusion of banks and financial institutions, which, which as Ellen just mentioned, are a key source of new capital for fossil fuel expansion. Um, so I'm gonna, yeah, I've, I kind of covered this, but, um, but kind of a lot of the metrics were establish a policy or um, disclose a methodology, but stopping short of actually saying what a good metric would be. Um, uh, yeah, none of the GFANS initiatives mention oil and gas phase out. The race, of you, some many of you probably saw this, but the race to zero recently introduced a criteria on phasing down and out fossil fuels, but then that's met with huge backlash and they've recently backtracked a little bit on that. Um, uh, justice inequity is is in there. There's a lot of mentions of just transition and even a fair share of emissions reductions, but then there's sort of not much engagement with what a fair share of emissions reductions actually looks like from a company level perspective and lots of citations of the 50% by 2030 um, sort of benchmark, which is just the global minimum. Um, 
yeah, and uh, the financial sector is excluded as well um, in a lot of the different benchmarks and even in the, the new sort of EU Paris aligned benchmarks, which is pretty problematic because that means that the financial sector is then the heavily, most heavily weighted sector, um, including one in indexing uh, index provider that we engaged with where JP Morgan was the, the biggest holding in the <laughs> in the benchmark, which is the largest financer of fossil fuels since the Paris Agreement was signed. Um, so um, with these limitations, we decided to develop our, our own set of criteria for what we think would be a good um, benchmark for whether a company's um, aligning with the Paris Agreement or at least the goal to limit global warming to 1.5. Um, we focused on three core sectors to start off with, um, oil and gas, or energy um, as, oh, that's four. No, one. one left, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, the energy sector is the supply, the utility sector is the demand, and the finance sector is facilitators. Um, I think um, there's not time to go into each of these, but, I, but we're very much soliciting feedback and we'd love to hear your thoughts either in the questions or afterwards engaging on whether these are good metrics and where to get data on these things, because that's one thing that we've heard from index providers is they just don't have the data on these things, which is an interesting finding in and of itself. Um, but I think, yeah, one thing to, to just mention is we've tried to embed the fair share of emissions reductions and fossil fuel phase out dates, adjusting for wealthy countries that have a historical responsibility for emissions. But there's a challenge there because um, uh, most of those pathways that look at, look at fair share of emissions reductions are based at the national level and translating that to a corporate or a sectoral level, most of those pathways use like a economic efficiency approach. So translating across those levels is really challenging. Um, so at the moment, we've just taken a headquartering approach, but it has limitations in a number of ways. So um, these are our metrics on the energy sector. Again, with fin banks and finance um, institutions, it's just about looking at new capital for expansion and phasing out existing in line with the fair share approach, similar for power utilities. And then we also have some cross-sectoral metrics on anti-climate lobbying, deforestation and biodiversity, just transition, and social justice. But again, these these social things are um, difficult to pin down into quantitative metrics. So your feedback on that, very welcome as well. Thanks very much. And in our next talk, we will hear about uh, the G20 countries continuing to uh, finance fossil fuels. Uh, our speaker is Bronwyn Tucker. Uh, she's Global Public Finance Co-Manager at uh, Oil Change uh, International. So. Room. Oil change uh, does research and campaigns uh, and movement building kind of towards uh, hopefully a globally just uh, transition uh, away from uh, oil and gas. And so, um, yeah, today I'll be talking about our uh, core t uh, tool that uh, our team, the public finance team uses, uh, which is the Public Finance for Energy uh, database. And I'm cheating slightly from the title because it is of the presentation because it is a kind of rolling uh, body of research. And so, um, and there's been some exciting kind of political momentum. So covering some things that are um, a little bit newer than um, those two papers, which are the last two like major updates of this uh, database that we wrote about. Um, and so, yeah, I, um, uh, in terms of um, kind of what this covers, um, it, so it's the G20 countries and really a small portion of public finance. And so it's uh, kind of development finance institutions and export credit agencies, um, as well as the major multilateral development banks. Um, and yeah, all, all of the kind of data is um, publicly available um, at energyfinance.org. And so I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on methodology today, but happy to chat about it. Um, but yeah, just to um, kind of put public finance a little bit into context um, and specifically like also really international public finance um, a bit more specifically. I mean, these two bubbles are the kind of like big picture takeaway uh, that the, these institutions um, are still funding way more fossils uh, than for clean energy in terms of what we can track. Um, and yeah, I think there's, I think 
in terms of public finance. I do love to kind of emphasize that. I think it um, can be very powerful. Um, public finance institutions have a lot of tools that they aren't using. Um, and when they do use them, they're still mostly using them to kind of prolong the fossil fuel era. Um, but they could, if they were pushed to, uh, kind of be very key actors for a redistributive, transformative, pro-public just transition. But right now, they're too busy funding fossils to do that. Um, so yeah, to kind of um, this, I might get in trouble for showing because it's embargoed and not reviewed yet. But um, so I'm trusting everyone. Um, but it is an exciting like example of kind of the area, area especially that this finance can be powerful in, which is like large infrastructure projects um, traditionally. And so if you look at uh, LNG export terminals, it's been um, for like relatively small amounts of money has gotten or helped get a lot of them built, which is, uh, yeah, don't don't love it, but an exciting stat. Um, and yeah, uh, I'm actually going to go through, go back to that one. But in terms of just putting this money slightly into context a little bit more, uh, we would be the first to say there's a ton of uncertainties in our numbers because there's not enough transparency. So we don't know for sure around these numbers, but it's what we can find. Um, and then, yeah, uh, for a few years, IISG and ODI and OCI would publish uh, these three numbers together to get a broader number of fossil fuel support. Um, and Bloomberg's been using the same methodology and will be publishing an update ahead of COP, which is exciting. Um, and then, yeah, I think also striking to look at the clean money we can find from, find from these institutions, which overlaps with uh, uh, climate finance tracking. Um, but I think striking that that like uh, public climate finance number that's more recently available is almost exactly outweighed by, by the uh, fossil fuel kind of support that's continuing from these institutions. Um, and I won't spend too much time on this one, but I think also just helpful to note that, um, you know, in terms of money that maybe could and should be flowing internationally, um, uh, you know, there this kind of uh, piece on climate reparations um, should be a lot larger um, on top of these already kind of stunning numbers. So, yeah, I guess. Um, sorry, I'm going to give everyone a <laughs> whiplash just to give the like breakdown of kind of the data set as a whole. This is the last three years. Just, I think, uh, gas is the biggest and growing. And like, of course, developments this year are not uh, like the political developments and backsliding around some of the policies on this. I think definitely worried about that kind of gas piece um, not going away. Um, and then, sorry to take everyone. OK, great. Going back to this graph, I think, um, I mean, in terms of the three categories of institutions, uh, export credit agencies are by far the worst for fossil fuels. And so that's why we switched the order, because Igor is going to go into like uh, great detail on ECAs specifically. Um, and yeah, I think otherwise um, helpful or probably obvious here to note that the clean energy uh, green band here is pretty stuck. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that is also um, I think also like one of the more surprising findings um, that it hasn't gone up um, as we've seen a lot of commitments on that side. Um, but yeah, just to go through a few more uh, data summary points, um, this is kind of how the G20 countries uh, shake out. Um, this doesn't, this is just it, the like ECAs and development um, banks. And yeah, I think, um, I mean, I always will shout out Canada because that's where I'm from. Um, they're yeah, getting away with a lot and actually don't get a ton of attention for that. Um, and yeah, on the recipient side, um, this is how it shakes out. I think um, in terms of kind of uh, a lot of like political narratives around gas and fossil, like, fossil fuels overall and development this year, I think it's striking like the top recipients are relatively wealthy um, for the most part. And then we definitely see if you dig into the numbers for when this money is flowing to lower income countries, it's often um, with really unfair contracts that aren't actually um, likely or maybe even possible to support development um, with that example from Mozambique pulled out. Um, but there is some exciting momentum. And so um, people have already mentioned the Glasgow public finance statement uh, a lot over the last few days. And so this is an uh, infographic from a report with ISD that we released in June, um, 
just trying to tally up the kind of non-G20 um, actors as well. And I think exciting also when I think we've been thinking a lot about kind of multilateral um, uh, like voluntary initiatives and trying to build norms. And this one, I think just in terms of it was made last year at COP, but had a deadline of the end of this year. Um, and yeah, just had some really concrete um, kind of <laughs> criteria. And so um, the next two months, I think, will be really busy of actually trying to herd everyone to meeting this policy. Um, this is the list of countries. Um, but if we go back up to this graph, um, Canada signed on, uh, the US, Italy, Germany, UK, uh, and France are also signed on. Japan kind of did because at the G7 this year, um, uh, the other countries really like G7 was isolated as the only non-signatory, um, but there was definitely a little bit of LNG uh, loopholes, extra loopholes in that statement, but definitely exciting to see a lot of that um, really like a, a large number of countries uh, signed on to a supply side initiative. And so hopefully there's lots of room to grow this. Right now we're focused on making sure it doesn't get watered down and like become meaningless. But I think um, there's, uh, I think through the OECD and potential um, export credit arrangements, um, there's a lot of potential. There is potential to, of course, just mainstream it to other countries. Um, and then I think also hopefully to other supply side um, initiatives or other kind of uh, financial justice issues. Um, and, but yeah, that mm, <laughs> this one, um, but just to maybe finish, because I know I'm running out of time. Um, yeah, I think just on the Glasgow statement still, I think the kind of um, obviously with the energy crisis, cost of living pieces this year, um, the kind of there's about six of the like 13 major. Um, so there's 39 signatories, but um, around 13 that have like major amounts of money going um, internationally um, and about six of them have real policies um, but then we still have a group of kind of uh, like Italy, Germany, Canada, US um, that are the biggest of that group and still missing um, and they're also being quite unhelpful having mixed messages but um, a lot of them are on the cusp of um, or have policies in development and so it'll be a fun one to watch over the next a uh, couple of months um, and definitely happy to chat with anyone who's really active in those countries and could be uh, uh, has ideas on how to push those governments over the line. Um, and yeah, I wanted to finish just on um, this slide, which is unfortunately missing, um, got the title cut off. But basically, in terms of kind of where also some of these institutions could go if they um, are pushed to and kind of pass this stop funding fossils. Uh, obstacle is I think just like a lot of the tools that they do have could be really important for a globally just transition. And so, you know, we have a lot of infrastructure to build. There's a lot of regional economic diversification and redistribution needed and public banks are pretty, um, have a lot of tools to do that. Um, and I think just in specific, um, there's some good, yeah, overall, there's some really great case studies in both of these publications. Um, but maybe specifically, um, and yeah, you know, the the one example I'll use that I think is is helpful to think about is um, also they have an ability to kind of cross subsidize, and so I think in public finance there's a lot of discourse around using um, like what are the things that public finance is most important to fund, and um, not going into what private sector can do. Um, but there's uh, some great case studies of public banks using profitable sectors to cross subsidize some of the like social supports or less profitable things. And so could be an exciting area. And yeah, sorry to be cutting it close. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Bronwyn. And uh, yeah, I mean, the direction of travel is clear. And yet, it's also clear that things are very murky. I think um, that that has come through both of these talks uh, very clearly in terms of the the lack uh, of uh, of applicable indicators uh, that Ellen and Emily um, uh, spoke about. And also, you know, all of these different numbers, of course, um, you know, we noticed, uh, you know, uh, subsidies are sometimes combined with tax exemptions. Um, and of course, the two um, have 
may have different effects and, uh, and different baselines to measure against. Um, our next talk uh, is by Igor Shishlov. Uh, he's with uh, Perspectives Climate Research, um, a consultancy, a research consultancy, where senior climate policy and finance experts and also the academic uh, director of climate and business program at HEC Paris. Over to you. Pleasure to be here. So um, I would like to talk a little bit about um, expert credit agencies and how expert credit agencies uh, should be aligned with the Paris Agreement. As Branwen rightly pointed out, uh, expert credit agencies are currently the largest class of uh, public finance institutions that are active internationally uh, in terms of their support to uh, to fossil fuels and of course this is um, this is a big problem. So the agenda of my presentation I will quickly talk about aligning finance with the Paris Agreement, sort of the big picture, uh, then I'll dive into the case of expert credit agencies uh, before talking about the assessment methodology uh, that we propose and some of the ca country case studies that we've uh, conducted over the past uh, two years and then I'll finish with a quick um, future outlook. Uh, all right, so what does it mean to align finance flows with uh, one and a half degrees? We've talked about it already uh, yesterday and today. Essentially, we've got the remaining carbon budget of around 500 gigatons until the end of the century to have a 50% uh, chance of meeting one and a half degree target. And what it means, well, we can discuss, you know, different trajectories, but essentially uh, net zero by 2050. And what that means is that uh, a large share of fossil fuel reserves uh, will have to stay in the ground. But what, we've see, what we see uh, happening in reality in the, in the finance space and especially in, uh, in public finance is what, uh, that both public and private finance for fossil fuels uh, significantly outweighs uh, finance for um, uh, adaptation and mitigation. Um, <clears throat> now, what we need to do is, of course, to withdraw the misaligned pi private and public finance and to redirect it to sustainable activities. And uh, we also mentioned, uh, I think yesterday, uh, quite extensively the <clears throat> net zero um, pathway by the International Energy Agency, which essentially, essentially says that we don't really need new investments in, uh, in new uh, exploration of, uh, of fossil fuels. Uh, now, if we look at the Paris Agreement and the role of finance, we see that it's mainly um, uh, main re revolves around two articles, Article 9, which is about providing climate finance to developing countries, and Article 2.1c, uh, which is really about making finance flows consistent uh, with the low carbon uh, development pathway. And uh, public finance institutions, um, both institutions and also different instruments, uh, such as, for example, investment treaties, uh, these uh, institutions and instruments play um, an, an overproportionally important role because uh, they have the capacity to uh, crowd in uh, private finance um, and uh, therefore they, uh, it is extremely important that they are, uh, first of all, aligned uh, with, the, with the Paris Agreement. And um, there are, in general, three types of uh, internationally active public finance institutions. There are multilateral development banks, bilateral finance institutions and expert credit agencies. And of course, as Brian said, uh, expert credit agencies uh, have recently become um, really the, the largest uh, supporters of, uh, of fossil fuels. And these institutions um, are, um, well, I guess I can say quite, quite obscure and less transparent than uh, multilateral development banks and bilateral institutions. Uh, there's little research, uh, at least uh, until about two, three years ago, uh, that went into uh, uh, into this topic, um, and this is um, this is why we thought uh, that the topic, you know, uh, calls for more attention, uh, more research, and um, together with my colleagues at Perspectives, we we started looking into this topic about <clears throat> two years ago. Um, so very quickly, um, w yeah, we already said that uh, that their fossil fuel support is more than ten times more than their support to clean energy. Uh, of expert credit agencies and uh, so what, what what these institutions are are essentially public or private uh, companies with an official mandate to pro to promote uh, national experts uh, abroad and they have a, a range of financial instruments uh, depending on the country they may or may not provide direct loans uh, uh, and and also they typically provide uh, different risk management instruments, uh, guarantees and insurance uh, schemes for experters. 
they receive premium or interest payments to break even and uh, they have a uh, transaction specific de-risking capacity uh, meaning that uh, actually, many uh, large-scale fossil fuel infrastructure projects in developing countries uh, happen uh, because of the support of export credit agencies. So they have the capacity to make or break uh, such large infrastructure projects. Well, you mentioned uh, previously Mozambique, I think, is a good example. Uh, uh, the, the notorious LNG um, uh, 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 project in, in Mozambique, which was backed by several export credit agencies from several countries and it would probably not have happened uh, without the support of these uh, institutions. And in fact, um, I will, in a few minutes, I'll talk about the Export Finance for Future Coalition. It's a coalition of 10 uh, countries uh, 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 looking at transforming uh, their, their export finance. So they themselves acknowledged uh, in, the, in the recent publication that the ECAs have done little to steer their portfolios in one direction or the other, and that uh, essentially, the portfolios of export credit agencies uh, rather reflect the export structure uh, of uh, specific countries. So, for example, in Denmark, where uh, we've got a lot of renewable energy experts, uh, uh, technology experts, uh, the Danish ECA uh, naturally uh, has more renewable energy in, uh, in its portfolio, whereas in Canada, it, uh, it may be, you know, uh, uh, the opposite. Um, Right, so um, a couple more words about the, the current um, context and what has been happening in the past uh, couple of years. So there's been um, quite a number of developments on, on the international level with regards to export credit agencies. So we've got the Export Finance for Future uh, initiative uh, of 10 European countries. Uh, they have recently published a, a, a transparency report where they provided a bit more uh, information uh, than we had before uh, with regards to their exposure to fossil fuels and um, uh, renewable energy. So that's that's something you know researchers and NGOs have been calling for um, uh, for a number of years. Uh, we've got the reform of the OECD arrangement, which is the main um, international policy governing um, export finance. Uh, last year, there was a, a ban essentially on official export credit for uh, coal-fired power plants. They stepped short of any restrictions on oil and gas, and of course, this is the next step that we should be uh, pushing for. Uh, and then the Glasgow uh, Statement on International Public Support for the Clean Energy Transition, which we um, already talked about today. Uh, it was unfortunately, uh, um, uh, to my understanding, uh, watered down by the uh, G7 in the, in the wake of the energy crisis. And there's some loopholes that have been uh, introduced with regards to uh, gas uh, and LNG imports. Uh, but well, that's, we, we can discuss it um, uh, afterwards. And then a couple of examples from uh, concrete export credit agencies. Uh, so the British uh, ECA, UCAF, uh, was in fact the first ECA to implement and not only commit to uh, phasing out most support for fossil fuel projects. There are still some uh, uh, some exceptions, but they're relatively uh, limited. Uh, and then the Dutch ECA developed a methodology to measure the exposure of its portfolio to the uh, um, uh, to fossil fuel value chain. So uh, all uh, uh, steps of the value chain up, mid and, and downstream, uh, which which I find quite interesting. All right, so um, I say I have very, very little time left, so let me just very quickly walk you through the assessment methodology which we proposed. We were essentially building the methodology on the E3G uh, methodology for public banks, uh, adapting it to the specificities of uh, uh, export credit agencies. So we've got five uh, assessment dimensions. These assessment dimensions are weighted. So essentially, we, the, 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 the heaviest weighted dimensions are related to mitigation, so the uh, restrictions on fossil fuel support, and also uh, targets related to uh, other uh, uh, carbon intensive sectors. And here you see the example of assessment of uh, UCAF. Uh, actually, it's the only country that we assessed so far uh, that, was scored, uh, that has scored some progress and not uh, unaligned, uh, and I don't know if we'll distribute presentations, but if we do, then there will be links uh, to these publications. Um, good, and um, so, so far we've done five case studies, and as you can see here, as I mentioned, only UCAF scored some progress. Other countries uh, we analyzed, uh, which were Germany, Japan, Netherlands, and Canada, all scored uh, unaligned. 
And in our uh, uh, case studies, we provide detailed uh, analysis of uh, you know what the gaps are and policy recommendations. And uh, I think the, um, uh, the the benefit of doing these case studies is that uh, we're also uh, while doing these studies, we're also trying to engage uh, with the governments with uh, I must say varying degrees of success uh, depending on the country. Uh, and I think these case studies are also uh, useful for uh, the NGO community, for the advocacy work. And uh, finally, uh, they also feed in uh, policy discussions on the international level, for example, uh, at the OECD. And currently we're working on four additional case studies, US, Italy, France and South Korea. Um, two of them will probably be published uh, before uh, the COP and two of them early, uh, uh, early next year. All right, so that's my last slide. Uh, very quickly, outlook on obstacles and opportunities. So um, uh, there is this argument, there's sort of the perceived risk of losing out uh, uh, from ceding hard fought for uh, market shares on, and uh, when, when seizing support to fossil fuels. And there is this, this argument that, okay, for example, if the OECD countries uh, withdraw, then uh, you know, some, some others would just step in. Um, there's also fragmented supranational policy landscape uh, the, obviously, the OECD arrangement only applies to the OECD countries, um, doesn't apply to, to China, for example. Uh, but we see also that there are some opportunities for transforming export finance. So I know that the first bullet point would be quite controversial using the EU taxonomy, because with the recent additions of, of gas, uh, of course, there are um, uh, a lot of reservations. Uh, there's At the same time, there's a lot of political momentum from COP26 and the E3F initiative, which I uh, uh, mentioned earlier. And there is also potential for increased climate-related uh, cooperation in different forums like the G7 uh, Climate Club proposal. So hopefully we will see uh, more reforms uh, in this space, especially related to uh, oil and gas uh, uh, export finance. And uh, with that, I apologize for running one minute late. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Igor. And of course, anytime uh, you provide grades and public, publicly release them in comparison, uh, you, will, you will have an impact there. Our next uh, talk is on climate finance for coal transition. And our speaker is Amanda Schockling, uh, who is a climate policy analyst um, for uh, climate with Climate and Company, which is a sustainable finance uh, think tank. And Amanda usually works on public policy projects towards the EU. Um, policy landscape. Over to you. Thank you for the introduction. So as Frank said, I work for Climate and Company, and our mission as a company is focused on the intersection of environmental sustainability goals and the financing aspects, because to achieve sustainable development, we need to get the financing right. So this research that I'm presenting on today was funded by the European Commission and the German development agency GIZ, and we were guided by the statement, to meet net zero goals, all countries need to stop burning coal. This is quite obvious, but as I'll we'll come to later, becoming climate neutral in Europe will not matter unless the whole world also does so. And the objective of our study was, how can Western countries support the financing of the coal transition in SPIPA member countries? So first, I'll start with a few key events that led us to the need to answer this question of Western countries financing a coal exit elsewhere. So 2015, we saw the Paris Agreement where global carbon emission goals uh, were set. Four years later, the European Union released its commitment to uh, reduce carbon emissions to zero by 2050 with an intermediate goal of 55% reductions by 2030. Last year at COP26, Western countries from the EU, the UK, and the US agreed on finance to help South Africa phase out of coal, and the exact plan is still being worked out in the Just Energy Transition Plan Partnership. And just a few months ago came word that the same nations that developed the finance uh, deal with South Africa now want to provide funding to India, Indonesia, and Vietnam, sorry, yeah, Vietnam at COP27 this year. So we performed this research focusing on SPIPA member countries, which are shown here in blue. And this is the strategic partnership for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And this is a group of countries that are crucial to have on board for the global energy transition, 
because 83% of all coal power capacity in the world is located in these countries, and 71% of all planned future capacity is also located there. Even though the global financing of coal plants is now more difficult due to trends towards ESG funding and financial disclosure regulations that may prevent the financing of new coal, it's still important to call attention to the extreme difficulties facing a lot of these non-OECD developing countries where coal use is locked in. Our research explored the economics of climate finance options available to engage internationally with a coal transition and explores the new transition solutions at our disposal to help countries transition from coal. And as I said previously, our study objective was to assemble the ways in which Western countries can support other countries in, their, in financing their coal transitions. So in the next slide, I'll show you um, a wallet of available coal transition mechanisms. And this is very simplified. Um, our report has a lot more details, but to keep it simple, um, this wallet contains, uh, instead of holding money, it holds the financial tools at our disposal to accelerate the global transition away from coal. So the tools in uh, blue are in the category of paying for closure. And these tools financially compensate coal plant owners for shutting down their plants before their expected retirement age. In purple, we have tools in the debt refinancing category, which provides the owner of a coal asset with low cost debt that must be repaid eventually in exchange for funding transition activities like decommissioning a coal plant or investing in clean energy. And lastly, the cards in green are in the buy and retire category, which is an investment vehicle that acquires a coal asset with the purpose of retiring it before its retirement age. And on the next three slides, I'll zoom into three of these coal transition mechanisms um, that have already been implemented um, around the world to give you a flavor of what we researched. So the first is concessional debt, and this is an investment deployed with lower interest rates than those on the market and with more lenient conditions to reimbursement. So here we interviewed the company Engi Energia in Chile and asked them about their decarbonization instrument, uh, which was launched in 2020 by the International Development Bank. So IDB provided a loan at market rates for the construction and operation of a wind farm in Chile, and it was supplemented with an additional concessional rate loan. The interest rate of the second loan will be decreased to below market rates in relation to the amount of emissions averted. Currently, the wind farm is in operation, but the planned disconnection of two coal-powered units was postponed due to capacity concerns as drought in Chile has impacted the nation's hydropower generation. And from our interview with Engi, we learned that the concessional loan did actually not speed up the coal phase-out process. Uh, Engi is an international company, and they already had plans uh, of their own, um, and they would have closed these plants anyways but this is just a pilot instrument and it could be used in different contexts elsewhere. <coughs> Compensation was already mentioned this morning by Elias, and this has been used in Germany's coal exit in which hard coal plants receive a closure premium through competitive reverse auctions. So how this works is a federal agency in Germany determines the amount of capacity to be reduced in each auction round based on reduction targets set out in German coal exit law. And that then coal, coal plant operators make a bid for the price they'd be willing to accept to close their plants at. And since it's a reverse auction, the winning bids are the lowest, not the highest. And in 2027, closure will be mandated anyways without any financial compensation. So this incentivizes operators to put in their bids early on in the process. And while the auctions have are meant to ensure that the payments are kept as low as possible. They've been criticized as being ineffective and wasteful, as plants that were already making a profit loss were awarded these closure premiums in the first auction round. And there's also a form of direct compensation that's going to lignite plants in Germany, but this is controversial and costly, mainly because the calculations uh, of the amount given to these plant operators were based on assumptions favorable to the coal companies. And I should mention that this uh, type of compensation is also being investigated uh, by the EU Commission for possible breach of state aid law. 
And the last mechanism I will mention is ratepayer-backed bond securitization. And this is a debt refinancing mechanism where securitized bonds allow the utility to refinance investments to support the early retirement and replacement of coal plants. And this mechanism is already being used by multiple energy companies in the U.S. It allows the utility to collect the a full return of the net book value of the retired coal power plant. And it does so by with a securitization payment, which is a surcharge placed on customers' electricity bills to pay back the debt of low interest rate bonds and invest in clean energy that will eventually replace the retired coal asset. So I've presented an example of three of these tools, but in our research, we also explore a range of theoretical tools that haven't been actually used or tested yet. Um, and just one of those is an, the idea of debt for climate swaps, but debt for coal exit swaps. So the main thing I want you to remember from this presentation is that phasing out coal is not a straightforward process. In fact, there are many different roads that lead us to Paris many ways in which the coal exit can be accelerated. And from our research, we assembled a wallet of financing mechanisms to phase out coal, as well as mentioned their justice implications. We found that there are upsides and downsides to each of these tools and contexts where they can or cannot work. Lastly, we found that each country requires a tailored approach to facilitating and financing a coal phase out because each financing mechanism has specific requirements and situations that need to be present for a financing tool to actually achieve the goal of a coal phase out. Thank you so much for listening and um, you can find our report on our website. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. I feel like we're really learning things. Um, I saw there were some quantifications of the carbon equivalent penalty there as well. Maybe we'll have a chance to get, get back to that and many other points in the presentations uh, in, in the Q&A. Our final speaker is Trusa Dordi. He's a doctoral candidate in sustainability management, University of Waterloo, uh, working mainly in climate finance, energy policy and risk management. And I think your findings are that a small number of players can make a large difference, right? Yes, okay. Thank you so much for, for having me here. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to be back in person. My name is Trusar Doherty. I am a newly minted doctor from the University of Waterloo. I finished my PhD. Thank you. Oh my gosh, stop. <laughs> um, and I am now a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Victoria in British Columbia. Uh, so I'm thrilled to share to, today uh, the final paper of my dissertation. Uh, it was an international collaboration with uh, Sebastian Grieke at the University of Otago in New Zealand, uh, Dr. Alan Naif uh, at the Banque de France, uh, and uh, Dr. Olaf Weber at the University of Waterloo. And we were looking at how just 10 financial actors can accelerate a transition away from fossil fuels. Uh, a, a little bit of motivation before I get into the presentation. I've been looking at fossil fuel divestment for nearly eight years now. And every time I speak to an investor, uh, one argument that I hear constantly is that they'd rather engage with the industry, right? So my question here is, can they engage with the industry? How much influence do these shareholders have and who has that influence? Uh, so I'm, I'm sure I'll be uh, preaching to the choir to start with, but uh, the, the 200 largest fossil fuel co companies, colloquially known as the Carbon Underground 200, are a carbon bomb. If they uh, emit uh, their proven reserves, it would surpass our carbon budget three times over. So there's this critical need to constrain these emissions in order to meet our, our climate targets. Uh, does finance have a role to play in this? Maybe I can convince you yes after the end of this presentation. Uh, and, and broadly, the, 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 the topic that, that we're looking at here through who can, uh, who can make that influence uh, we look at it through a lens of spatial finance and a lens of uh, network analysis to, to identify that. We look at the 200 fossil fuel firms, the Carbon Underground 200, as well as uh, we, we get shareholder ownership data from the Bloomberg database, collectively 918 uh, shareholders. And what's unique about this is not only do we collect the direct owners, but we also collect the indirect owners who own the, the owners. Uh, and what we find is just 10 of these, these actors who will uh, show right at the very end, uh, own half of the emissions potential from the Carbon Underground 200. 
uh, there is a case to be made for them to lead this transition, but we also argue that if they don't, we should hold them accountable for continuing to finance the economic activities that lead to uh, climate instability. So I'll go really quickly on this. I mentioned again the Carbon Underground 200. For those uh, who may not be familiar with it, uh, it's publicly listed companies. 98% of uh, global reserves are held by these companies. If they burn their reserves, they would emit 674 gigatons of emissions. For context, our global carbon budget as of 20, uh, 2021 was, I believe, about 240 gigatons, right? So this is three times greater, uh, 674, 20 times greater than our global uh, output in, in 2019. So Im immense uh, holdings in, in the fossil fuel industry. Capital markets have historically played a role in this transition in, in terms of uh, uh, steam and telecommunications. And, and so what we argue here is that they can once again play a role in the low carbon transition as well. Typically, from a theoretical perspective, uh, shareholder engagement is looked at through the lens of agency theory. In this study specifically, we look at a sustainability transitions theory called the multi-level perspective. Uh, and and that the idea there is that niche innovation in the financial sector can influence incumbent regimes. All we need is a, a small spark through, through, those, uh, through those players. Getting right into the results. Uh, so the first one is that that spatial uh, finance aspect. We use a typology from Wojcik over here. And I'll just make two quick points over here. So first around the domestic piece, half of the size here. And you can imagine domestic ownership uh, is, is defined as, uh, you know, a, a U.S. firm who has uh, holdings in a U.S. stock exchange, uh, a, a U.S. firm traded on a U.S. stock exchange. So the United States, China, uh, India, Canada, Japan all have quite quite an influential role and, and they should be leading that transition at home. And there's evidence that uh, domestic ownership is actually more effective in, in shareholder engagement as well through work by uh, Dimson and all. Uh, the second piece I wanted to talk about is, is this piece around um, import, uh, import ownership, the purple square, which is also quite substantial. Um, and, and so what this, what this tells us is that uh, you know, you can imagine this as a U.S. shareholder who owns uh, shares in a Canadian firm traded on a Canadian stock exchange. The United States has a lot of that type of ownership, right? So this raises questions around carbon leakage, a different form of carbon leakage. Uh, who is producing the fossil fuels and who is profiting from that production? All right, so getting into the networks uh, side of things, we use a bipartite network analysis. Basically, all that means is there are two types of nodes uh, and a directed link, uh, one direction uh, towards the two of those. So in, in this case over here, the red dots, the red nodes are uh, the uh, fossil fuel firms, and then the gray dots around that are, are their shareholders. Uh, we can quantitatively test this. We use two measures to quantitatively test this, degree centrality. You can really think about this as the person who knows everyone, right? They're, they're well connected. So in the example of the blue square over there, B is connected to A, C, D, and E, right? High degree centrality, and this can be normalized if needed. Uh, the second one is closeness centrality. Uh, where, do they, where do they sit in connection to other nodes, right? So if A or C want to talk to D or E, they would have to go through B, right? That's the person who can bring people together. Uh, in our large network over here in the orange square right up top, we see this sort of low degree centrality, right? So, you know, a, a firm with maybe one or two major shareholders right in the center, a really deep network, right? So, yeah, a lot of, lot of holdings. And then some of the, uh, the closeness centralities, the indirect holdings uh, in, in the blue square right at the very bottom there. We break this down a bit further and, and look at the uh, different types of asset owners uh, in the orange square right over there. That's Norges Bank right in the center. They have, uh, they have holdings in, in many firms. But generally speaking, if you look at the, uh, the public uh, government side of things, it's typically larger holdings in, in one or two firms. The size of that blue uh, uh, line, the edge, uh, represents the size of that holding. Uh, investors, so these are the Black Rocks and Vanguards of the world. Again, you can see this really, really high level of... Uh, of uh, uh, degree centrality concentration, right? This is a, a, a proxy for influence and power in the industry. And then finally, the, uh, the high net worth individuals as an example, uh, you know, typically holdings in one or, uh, you know, a shareholder might own one or two firms. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, lastly, we, uh, 
have uh, made an interactive platform, which you can uh, check out online. You can scroll over each of these dots and see uh, who the uh, firms are and who their, their shareholdings are. I'm happy to share that if anyone's interested. Uh, and finally, the, the, what I think is most exciting is uh, the list of the... <laughs> uh, <laughs> So uh, the, the way we calculate and, and rank these shareholders is based on that degree centrality, how central they are to the network. And, and again, that's a proxy of influence and power, as well as the emissions, right? So uh, in, in this case, we can see uh, the Black Rocks and, and Vanguards of the world, very central to the network, but lower emissions versus uh, perhaps, you know, the government of India or the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, substantially higher uh, emissions uh, holdings, but, but lower degree. And, and that's uh, the, the method we use to rank those. I'll leave that out for, for two more seconds. <laughs> How many are on the list? That's 20, so uh, up to Capital Group. All right, uh, cool, so closing up, uh, I believe that the low carbon transition can be championed by a small, influential group of shareholders. Uh, we we analyze this through a network analysis uh, to identify who those shareholders might be. And through the lens of the multi-level perspective theory, uh, we believe that niche innovations in these uh, uh, shareholders can lead uh, to change in the incumbent regime. And niche innovations could be all of these conversations around uh, G fans, their the precedents around physical and, and transition risk to act on climate change. But once again, uh, we do we do stress that uh, if they don't act on climate change, they should be held accountable for propagating uh, climate instability. Uh, oh, one last piece, real quick. Uh, the paper is published now, so feel free to go uh, and and find it if you need. Uh, we were really fortunate to get a lot of uh, media pickup on it as well. So if you find uh, the work interesting, please do engage with it online. It, it helps uh, tremendously to uh, get the message out to environmental NGOs and, and governments and such. And on that, thank you again. Uh, it, was, it was great to present. Thanks, Matthew. Well, fascinating stuff. And uh, thank you, um, Dr. Doherty. Uh, look, we've, we've covered a huge amount uh, of terrain here. I'm sure there's lots of questions in the room. We have just over 15 minutes. Um, I propose, that's me here on the keyboard. Um, well, we'll leave that up. That's good. Um, we, I, I propose we take questions in couples or in threes uh, for, for a more efficient conversation. And so the floor is open. Um, and do indicate to me ahead, ahead of time if you want to ask the question. So I uh, saw so Christian first and then uh, in the middle here. I'm, I apologize if I forget names. Um, the two of you first. Hi, Christian from the Australian National University. This is just a question for uh, Bronwyn and Igor around export credit agencies. Fascinating work. Um, two questions. One, could you tell you a little bit more about the types of ECAs? Are they all, do they all come in the same structure or some... What's the bureaucratic structure of these organisations and are there various types under the banner of ECAs? And two, Igor, you mentioned that you had varying degrees of success in engagement. I'm curious where you got more access and where you got less. Thanks. And right here in the middle. Hi. Um, I guess my question is more for Brown. And in your slides, you had uh, one that where the money was coming out from, so the countries and where it was going to. And mainly, of course, we've got Global South countries in there. And I was wondering uh, if you considered, if you looked at, if you considered, and how did you consider technical assistance? Because in some cases, they also foster transparency and they're very tricky in my person. So I wanted to understand what you, how you considered them. So jump right in, panel. Take the questions as you wish. Do you want to start with ECA, thanks? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Um, all right, yeah, thanks. Uh, um, thanks for the for the questions. Uh, Christian, I'll pick your uh, uh, your question on, on the types of uh, of ECAs um, and also the engagement with different governments. So yes, um, there are different uh, types of ECAs in terms of their um, structure and uh, uh, their, their nature. So in some countries, you have ECAs that are essentially um, government agencies. Um, 
Like an example of that would be, um, I guess, the, the, the UCAF. Um, and then you've got um, different countries where you can have private companies uh, mandated uh, by the government uh, to perform the role of uh, supporting uh, exports. And uh, an example of that would be um, uh, earlier Hermes in, in, in Germany, for example. Um, they also, as I mentioned, differ very much in terms of the types of instruments they offer. So some of them are so-called pure cover uh, ECAs. Uh, they provide only um, risk management instruments, whereas others can also provide financing uh, in, in the form of loans uh, uh, and such. And then on the question with the um, engagement success, so indeed it's been uh, it's been very different depending on the countries, um, on, on the countries. So in in Germany, for example, we had uh, a relatively good engagement with the government, probably related to the fact that we are a German institution and we have relatively good connections. Uh, we also had some um, constructive discussions with um, colleagues from the Netherlands. Um, and 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 from uh, from Canada as well, actually, um, uh, surprisingly. Whereas, for example, in uh, in Japan, we unfortunately didn't manage to talk to anyone uh, uh, from the government or from the ECA, uh, even though we tried to, uh, uh, to to access them also through uh, through some of the NGO partners, but we were really uh, unsuccessful there. And in the UK. Uh, strangely, uh, during the research, again, we didn't manage to talk to anyone. We only managed to talk to uh, some of the government representatives after we published the report. They were more receptive then. Yeah, and then just to, um, on ECA types, just to add in really briefly, I think also, uh, yeah, you do get lots of exceptions as well. And so like in Canada, um, a lot of that is a weird, a lot of their finance uh, is a weird loophole from after the recession where they said, oh, we're going to finance domestic oil and gas now. And then they, they never stopped. Um, and uh, for in Brazil, for example, um, it's all part of their development bank as well. Um, and the NDES does a ton of um, uh, kind of national development bank roles as well, um, as well as export um, and development finance internationally. And so yeah, uh, and then also just outside of the OECD, I think, especially for ECAs, um, it's way less consistent if, if countries um, have them and also how um, how they'll act. Um, and then, yeah, on technical assistance, um, we do count it when we can, but it, it is often just so small compared to like bigger transactions. Um, but if you, you can download the data and the, the background um, info on kind of assumptions will be there. Uh, and then... I will say on the kind of recipients, um, we find for clean support that it's it's um, like overwhelmingly like the most it's wealthy countries funding other wealthy countries for for renewables and for fossil fuels. Um, it, it is a little bit towards more lower income countries, but it, it's still more kind of uh, upper middle income or um, middle income and not actually the, the lowest income countries that are, are getting the fossil fuel support. Um, and that kind of really counters a lot of industry narratives from, from this year, especially. Did that cover the questions? Okay, very good. Okay, next question here in the middle. Um, then we're moving over to the right and then there's the next round. Hi, <clears throat> thanks very much. Um, so I'm Martin Sokol, Trinity College Dublin. Uh, thanks for an excellent session. This was absolutely fascinating. Uh, and congratulations to you all. Um, great stuff. Uh, one thing, however, that I was missing is a kind of stronger engagement with central banks and what they do. So public finance has been mentioned. They also influence private finance. So as we know, just very in the last couple of years during the pandemic, trillions of dollars and pounds and euros were pumped into financial markets, including fossil fuel, obviously, uh, industry. So my question is to all panelists, uh, what role do you think uh, central banks should be playing in transition to phase out fossil fuels and uh, save, save all of us? Okay, so central banks, and please just pass it to the, to the left. And yeah, very useful if you uh, let us know your affiliation. Hi, uh, Frederick Bauer, Lund University. Uh, so um, it was mentioned by Rose Bronwyn and Igor, right, that uh, this type of public funding um, through different mechanisms, including ECAs, can 
uh, really make these things happen. That it's it's uh, you indicate that it's a small share of the total funding. The majority is private, right? But uh, the public funding is important. So I'm just wondering if you have done research or know of any other research that has sort of traced this process. You know, if and if so, how and when in that process it really sort of makes that difference. Okay. Who would like to have a, a bite at these uh, at these two questions? Central banks. Um, what uh, very little we heard about central banks. Um, uh, uh, I can start really briefly um, uh, and also answer that question directly. Um, but on on central banks, I think um, in terms of uh, like it's. I think a lot of financial regulations are are like very hard to communicate to the public and build political support for. So I think there, one thing I'm excited about is a lot of the uh, like private bank campaigning campaigns and like looking at individual uh, banks that are kind of pub uh, known to the public. There's a lot of momentum in a lot of countries around, um, you know, fossil fuel divestment around banks that people engage with daily. And I think um, at least in some countries, I know there's kind of strategies to try to harness that towards uh, winning the more cross-cutting financial regulations that we need. Um, and yeah, uh, OCI did have a report on this last year called Unused Tools, just in terms of some of the actions um, they could take. Uh, and then, yeah, really briefly on um, kind of uh, uh, the kind of private crowd in from public finance. Um, I think it's actually something where um, at the, the public finance institutions themselves love to talk about how much private finance they're crowding in. And um, I think those numbers often really need to be taken with a grain of salt. Um, uh, and but yeah, I think in practice, it, it's really mixed. Like sometimes it is um, they are able to leverage a lot of other private finance, but there's also lots of public public arrangements um, or also times where they really are acting kind of similarly to a, a private institution. Um, yeah. Ellen, I think you want to. Yeah, I could add just a couple of things um so uh, in the same way as a, uh, a a bond index automatically drives new capital into um fossil fuels quantitative easing and so and so forth the purchase of bonds by central banks um you could view as a kind of demand stimulation for the bonds of these fossil fuel companies so um and, and again, that that isn't in many or most central banks will tell you that they just do this across the whole economy and that it's neutral, right? Which means that it is then going to proportionally suck up um, more fossil fuels because fossil fuels and other um, so-called sin stocks tend to resort to bond markets more so than equity markets anyway. So it's actually it's it's not neutral, even if it is neutral. Um, but yeah, that that will be a source of. Um, uh, new financing for fossil fuels um, in in times of quantitative easing. Um, the other thing, just to say, like I, I don't know. It was really interesting to hear all this stuff about um, uh, public banks and so on. Um, the overall literature on um, additionality by asset class, um, it kind of shows a pretty obvious thing, which is just that the earlier stage a project is at, the more it matters whether it's got money. Um, and the inverse is also true. Like there have been cases now in which like really big fossil fuel projects have had to be scaled down or self-financed because there wasn't enough um, supply of, of new capital to uh, make it at the original scale. So um, if that's helpful at all, the earlier stage you get that new money, which often probably will be more from, um, from public funds, um, the more important it is to scaling and so on. Mm -hmm. Next question is right next to the camera back here. That's right. Um, and another one. I saw several hands. Yeah, it's yours. Yeah, thanks a lot. Really interesting uh, discussions. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the panelists' view with respect to uh, the role of private equity as a source of financing. And, you know, in terms of the opaqueness, at least uh, some of the conversations we've had is about the access to information and the data around it. Uh, so, you know, as we progress, you know, the role of private equity and whether it's a, a, a barrier uh, to the transition, interested in the thoughts around what are the, you know, the sort of protections that can be put in around that. And the second element is also in terms of financing a just transition, uh, thinking about the decommissioning liabilities associated with uh, all of these projects and how that's being contemplated as part of uh, financing a just transition. Thanks. Sorry, I'm Nadara with the Commonwealth Secretariat. 
Excellent, thank you. Uh, microphone migrates to the front in the middle. Um, yep, right in the front. No, uh, first row, yeah, that's right. Uh, and to our panelists, um, those of you who haven't spoken yet in the discussion, preference to you. Um, my question is for Emily, Ellen, and Truzar. Um, so from Ellen, I heard, you know, shareholder engagement as we've seen, it hasn't really been working very well. From Truzar, I heard, here are the 10 actors who can make it work, but what are the forms of engagement that will make a difference in this case? Okay. Yeah, that's uh, right. Go yeah, for hi. it. Uh, this is Bala from ISG. Um, kind of a similar question. Uh, in the graphs that Bron Bronwyn, when you showed, there were these scales of finance on public finance, and most of it was on international public finance. But I was wondering about domestic public finance and how it scales compared to the international public finance. And Rosa, in your graphs, you showed how like countries like USA, India, China, they tend to invest domestically. So if there is a lot of domestic public finance, which I feel it might be, uh, what should be their strategies and whether they can be same or different as compared to these international public finance and how they should change their uh, sort of investment practices. Okay, so broad range of questions that might in fact see us out with the time, right? So make sure you say everything you want to say. Um, domestic public finance, how to engage and uh, the role of private equity. Go for it. I can start. Um Great questions. Uh, so, so on the, I'll, I'll start with the coordinate, uh, the domestic ownership side of things. Uh, it's it's promising to see that level of of ownership um, where shareholders are in the same country as as the firm because they share common policies and and they share the common cultural uh, aspects as well. Uh, the one takeaway from this piece is that we have that list of ten. But we also have a lot more shareholders, right? In this case, it, we had 918. Uh, coordinated engagement could be an effective tool in that in that type of uh, situation. So again, this is uh, work by Dimson et al. Uh, coordinated engagement appears to be more successful when uh, there is a domestic firm and uh, and a domestic shareholder. So I just wanted to get that point across. Uh, forms of engagement, uh, we need to go beyond disclosure. Yeah, it's, uh, obviously, <laughs> um, it's uh, and it's it's disheartening that uh, that we're seeing pushback on even that um, and and less uh, positive votes uh, on on that side of things. And then the opacity of private equity, yeah, it's it's unfortunate. Um, it makes research really difficult as well. Um, I'm not too sure uh, what the future of that's going to look like. But I'll open the floor for others. Emily Allen? Yeah, I could speak briefly to private equity. I mean, I, it's not my speciality, but I, I think one dimension where it comes into the bond index is that um, there's been a trend, and I think it's been mentioned a few times by different people, of um, uh, high carbon intensity assets getting bought up by private equity and as part of different types of institutions, divestment or like clean energy strategies. Um, and that having like either neutral or negative climate impacts. Um, so one one kind of movement that's emerged on that topic is just to do, to mandate closure rather than sale. So um, sort of like as an engagement ask, requiring institutions to make that plan for the closure of the asset and factoring in as part of that, the sort of like liability costs. So yeah, it's not a perfect answer and it won't apply for every sector, but kind of intervening to prevent before it's sold off to private equity is, is like one approach that that's been coming up. Maybe just to add on the private equity thing. And there are a couple of other just useful um, nubs here. One is um, that uh, private equity tends to be more kind of concentrated in specialist firms. Um, so you're going to want to look at um, the very biggest uh, private equity uh, firms, which will have uh, the probably the largest overall um, fossil fuel holdings. Um, but then you're going to want to look at the pure play um, fossil fuel um, firms. Um, and by the way, this makes it a little easier to divest in private equity if you are an endowment or pension fund or whatever, because you just have to usually you just have to get rid of the specialist funds and you're most of the way there. 
Um, and um, I guess the other thing is to say that, yeah, it these are still owned by pension funds and stuff, like the ultimate investors. Um, and this actually speaks to Truzar's list as well. The ultimate owners of um, the, this capital is often these big institutional investors like pension funds. Um, and so um, you can actually trace a lot. Yes, private equity is more opaque. Yes, it's harder to get at and so on. But many of the same owners are these institutions that you know we can get at. Um, and I guess the other thing I would say is that um, I suspect, and I don't know this, but there is evidence to suggest that the threat of divestment is quite effective. And just my own experience engaging with fund managers and banks is that the threat of um, a client leaving a fund manager or a bank is a huge lever. Um, and and those are the ones who are executing um, the engagement activities, the voting activities, the bond purchases, whatever else very often. So then you've got a narrower set of um, targets um, and the power is actually back at an institution that is more likely to take the stuff on board, not a black rock. Yeah. So we're right on time, but we will borrow a few minutes from the future. Um, and uh, so... Um, Last comments by Igor, Bronwyn, and Amanda in turn. Really, anything you want to comment on? Uh, yeah, maybe I'll just comment on the, on the previous question because I didn't get a chance to comment on uh, public finance actually triggering uh, uh, private finance. And uh, I think the case of ECAs is, is quite telling because, in fact, uh, in case of many ECAs in, within their, their mandate, uh, they, are, uh, they are supposed to step in where the private sector uh, does not. So where, where the private insurers uh, does not prov do not provide uh, uh, coverage uh, for, for example, large infrastructure fossil fuel projects in, in developing countries like Mozambique, uh, that's where ECAs can step in. So they can really make a, make a difference whether a project goes ahead or not. And I think that's, a, that's an illustration of how public finance really can trigger um, additional private finance. Um, and yeah, I'll just on... Um Domestic public finance, I'm really glad you asked because I actually think it's a really key like ga uh, gap in the data um, and one we used to try to cover, but it was too much. So I think looking again at maybe like who or how we can do that, because I think um, in terms of the just transition side, it, there's actually on the domestic public finance um, there, there's more examples of banks that have a creative and active role in industrial policy. So um, yeah, some like really cool uh, players on that side of things. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll end there. Yeah, I guess I just want to end to it. Um, I mean, I think today we talked a lot about the financing of the transition, but we need to also keep in mind that money cannot solve all, all the problems. And we also need to keep in mind the aspects of justice. And I think all of us are also thinking about that in our research. OK, look, a great set of papers, um, concise and clear presentations, good questions, happy session. A big round of applause, please. Yeah.